It is always a thrill to start a brand new class series, and this one is especially exciting. Saul and Barnabas are about to launch their first big missionary trip together. Barnabas and Saul have recently been entrusted to take a contribution from the believers in Antioch to the persecuted believers in Jerusalem. And they've taken with them a young helper named Mark. Sometimes he's called John, sometimes he's called John Mark, but he's young and he's one of Barnabas's relatives, uh, a nephew perhaps. And all three of them have now returned to Antioch. As the believers fast and pray, the Holy Spirit makes it clear to them that Barnabas and Saul are being called to a new work beyond pastoring the church at Antioch. So from Antioch, the three of them set sail for the island of Cyprus. Um, and that is after, hang on a sec. Yeah, I... I must have deleted a slide. The believers actually lay their hands on Barnabas and Saul and equip them. Just, um, it doesn't say anything beyond the fact that they lay the, lay pray for them and lay their hands on them. But there is something about laying hands on a believer that is sending forth that believer for a particular task. And if you remember that laying um, hands on uh, uh, believers when Peter and John did it, it was so they would receive the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is received for a purpose. Uh, it may be a purpose of praising God, but it's for a purpose. So, so the believers lay hands on them and they, the three of them set sail for the island of Cyprus. So I want you to note that um, on this uh, illustration, the dates are listed as 44, 46 in the picture itself, but that's not a unanimous consensus among scholars. I personally agree with those who think this first missionary journey is a couple of years earlier, beginning around 40 uh, common era and ending around 44 or 45. So everybody has a different timeline. I'm giving you my timeline. I think my timeline works. So do some of the others. Anyway, in Cyprus, they travel all over the island, preaching and teaching in the Jewish synagogues. And eventually, they tramp the entire 100 miles to the western end of the island to a town called Paphos. The proconsul there, uh, a proconsul is like a, a governor, Roman governor. So the proconsul is a man named Sergius Paulus. And he is seeking God. And he's already got a Jewish wise man, an astrologer, in his retinue. Now, this man is named Bar Yezu, but he is called Elumus, which means wizard or sorcerer. And although he tells the proconsul he speaks for God, he's actually a fake. When Sergius Paulus hears that about Barnabas and Saul, he sends for them, and Elumus sees a threat. He denounces them and tries to keep the proconsul from listening to them. But the Holy Spirit fills Saul, and staring right at Elumus, Saul says, Oh, you son of the devil, full of deceit and fraud. The hand of the Lord is against you, and you will now be blind for a time. And immediately, Elumus is enveloped in darkness and has to have people lead him around by the hand. Well, Sergius Paulus, of course, can't become a believer fast enough. <laughs> for now, he knows that Barnabas and Saul are speaking the truth about God. So notice the purpose of the miracle here. Sergius Paulus is a Roman governor. He's already genuinely been seeking God. This is a perfect place for a billboard from God to say, listen to Barnabas and Saul, not Illumis. And this undoubtedly spreads the good news because as you can see by the geography, Cyprus is a regular stopping off place 
for travelers through the Mediterranean. It is from this point on that the story refers to Saul by his Gentile name, Paul. It is here in Paphos that rather than being a team of Barnabas and Saul, as they were when they left Antioch, they become Paul and Barnabas. Paul steps into a leadership role here in Paphos and never looks back. From Paphos, Paul, Barnabas, and John Mark sailed to Perga, which is a town in a region called Pamphylia. And it's here that John Mark leaves them, like right in the middle of the journey. The parting is bitter, at least between Paul and John Mark. Paul says John Mark deserts them. Well, John Mark returns to Jerusalem, while Paul and Barnabas continue north to a town called Pisidian Antioch. This is not the same as the Antioch in Syria, where they started their journey. Pisidian Antioch is the southern part of a region called Galatia. And as they normally do, when the Sabbath comes, Paul and Barnabas head straight for a Jewish synagogue. After the part of the service where um, passages from the law and the prophets are read, the leader of the synagogue invites the visitors to speak. Paul stands, waves his hands for silence, and says, Men of Israel and Gentile God-fearers, hear me. The God of Israel chose our fathers and with his arm lifted them up out of slavery. For 40 years, he put up with their behavior in the wilderness, and he gave them the promised land, deposing seven Canaanite nations. All of that took about 450 years. And after this, God gave his people judges to lead them all the way through to the time of Samuel the prophet. But then the people demanded a king. So God gave them Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, and he ruled them for 40 years. Then, after removing Saul, God gave them David as king, saying, I have found in David a man after my own heart, someone who will do my will. It is from David's descendants, just as he promised, that God has brought Jesus, the Savior, to Israel. Jesus is the one John the Baptist testified about. Even before Jesus came, John preached to all the people that they needed to repent and be baptized. And even then, John said, don't think so highly of me. There is one coming after me, and I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Sons of Abraham and Gentile God-fearers, it is to us the message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers willfully ignored him. Instead, they condemned him fulfilling the prophecies read on every Sabbath. And even though they could find no reason to put him to death, they demanded that Pilate execute him. And when they had done their worst, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead and for many days he was seen by those who had come with him to Jerusalem from Galilee. They are now his eyewitnesses to the people. And now we, we are telling you the good news. God has fulfilled the promise made to our ancestors. He has fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus up in fulfillment of the second psalm that says, you are my son, today I have birthed you. God never intended that Jesus see decay. As God said through Isaiah, 
I will give you the holiness and faith of David. And in Psalm 1610, you will not allow your Holy One to see decay. But David did die and was buried and his body decayed. But the one God raised from the dead did not see decay. Know therefore that it is to you personally that the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed through Jesus. Think of all the righteousness you were never able to achieve through the law of Moses. Yet everyone who believes in Jesus is declared righteous. By the way, this is a mainstay of Paul's theology, that Jesus came to tell us our sins are forgiven, and if we, are, if we believe, we are made righteous in a way not possible under the law. This is, this is the part we're going to talk about in our breakout groups. Paul continues, take care that what was prophesied does not happen to you. Look, you who despise and scoff, says the prophet Habakkuk, marvel and vanish, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe even if someone told you about it. Well, all this is very interesting and thought-provoking to the Jews and the Gentile God-fearers gathered at the synagogue. So they invite Paul and Barnabas to come speak some more on the next Sabbath. And many of them follow after them as they leave, and Paul and Barnabas talk with them some more and encourage them to continue seeking God. The next Sabbath, pretty much the whole city crowds in to hear. When the religious leaders see the crowds, they are filled with jealousy and start arguing with Paul and slandering him. But Paul and Barnabas stand their ground saying, God sent us to tell you the good news first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will go to the Gentiles. In fact, that is what God commanded us to do through the prophet Isaiah. He said, I have set you as a light for the Gentiles, for you to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. As a note, in its original context in the Hebrew Bible, this is a prophecy uh, in which the Lord is speaking to the Messiah. But here, Paul is claiming this as the marching orders for him and for Barnabas. Well, of course, the Gentile God-fearers are thrilled to hear this. The Jews, not so much. As word spreads through the town, the religious leaders get the leading ladies and the rulers of the city all stirred up about Paul and Barnabas. And in the end, Paul and Barnabas are ignominiously tossed out of Pisidian Antioch. So, they shake the dust off their feet and filled with the Holy Spirit and with joy, they walk to Iconium, a Galatian town about a hundred miles away. Once again, Paul and Barnabas head straight for the synagogue. This time, many Jews and Greeks listen, respond, and believe, but not all of them. The Jews who don't believe start stirring everyone up and causing divisions. Nevertheless, Paul and Barnabas stay in, in Iconium a long time, speaking the good news, and the Lord supports their message by giving them signs and miracles to perform. Nevertheless, the strife between the unbelievers and Paul and Barnabas continues to escalate until finally, Paul and Barnabas get wind of a planned attempt on their lives. So they flee Iconium and move on to the nearby Galatian city of Lystra, which is only about 20 miles away. While preaching there, Paul meets a man who has been lame from birth. The man listens to Paul carefully, and Paul seeing the intensity of the man's faith to be healed, calls loudly, 
stand up. And immediately the man springs up onto his feet and begins to walk. The crowd is amazed. They've known this man from birth. They start shouting. It's the gods come down to earth in human form. And they point to Barnabas and say, that one is Zeus. And they point to Paul and say, that one is Hermes. And there is a temple to Zeus nearby. And the priest of that temple brings garlands and, you know, like garland crowns and bulls to make sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Well, Paul and Barnabas are horrified. They tear their clothes, rush into the crowd, shouting, no, no, don't do this. We are only human. We're bringing you good news so you can turn away from this nonsense to the living God who created all things, heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. But even with this, Paul and Barnabas can barely keep the people from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews arrive from Pisidian Antioch and from Iconium. They have pursued Paul and Barnabas here to Lystra, bringing with them strife and division. They rile up the crowd and the joy in God's miracle of healing that man turns sour as the mob drags Paul outside the city and stones him, nearly killing him. In fact, he appears dead and does not rise. The disciples encircle him. These are probably very new disciples standing in a circle looking down at what is left of Paul. It does, doesn't say in the passage, but Surely they must have prayed for him, thinking him dead. How shocked they must have been when Paul gets up and stumbles back into Lystra. Is this another one of God's billboards for the people of Lystra? Did Paul just rise from the dead? I think Paul may have had a near-death experience here. Fourteen years later, Paul writes about it in a letter. And just so you understand the context of what he writes, the situation uh, around this letter is that someone has accused him of talking big in his letters, but being unimpressive when he shows up in person. So Paul is responding with his typical sarcasm. He talks about willing to be a boastful fool for the Lord. He says, and I'll keep boasting and while we're at it, let's talk about visions from the Lord. I know a man who was caught up to the third heaven. This is another term for paradise in this culture. It's what we would simply call heaven nowadays. Paul writes, I'm not sure if this man was in the body or out of the body, but he was caught up to paradise and heard words no man may utter. If I wanted to boast, I would boast about such a man. But I don't want you to think highly of me because of such great revelations. In fact, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to strike me so I will not become conceited. I begged the Lord three times to take this thorn in the flesh away from me, but he said, my grace is enough for you. It is in weakness that power is perfected. So I boast in my weaknesses gladly. So the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And as I see it, the timeline and the circumstances and Paul's description fit for this to be a near-death experience here when Paul is stoned at Lystra very early in his ministry. And it makes sense to me that his thorn in the flesh was some sort of, you know, injury from this terrible beating, maybe an internal injury. He can still walk and talk and minister, but he is in pain, somehow hampered. Nevertheless, the fact that he rose from this near-death experience and walked into the city 
is a miracle. I don't think from Paul's description that he is even sure whether he died and was rather resurrected or whether it was just a near-death experience. He said, I don't know if this man was in the body or out of the body. Well, Paul rests overnight in Lystra, and the very next day, he and Barnabas leave for Derby, another Galatian city. Again, they preach the good news, and again, many more people become disciples. And afterwards, they retrace their steps, meeting with the new disciples they left behind and encourage them, encouraging them, telling them that they'll go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. And in each of these towns, churches of believers have formed. So Paul and Barnabas appoint leaders that they call elders or overseers in each church, and they set these men before the Lord. I think that by placing them before the Lord, Paul and Barnabas are both asking for the Lord's hand to be upon them, these new leaders and also reminding them that they're accountable to the Lord. After that, Paul and Barnabas head for the coastal city of Italia, where they set sail for Syrian Antioch, the place where they started this first missionary journey. And there, Paul and Barnabas gather everyone together and tell them what God has done and how he welcomed the Gentiles into the faith. Then Paul and Barnabas stay in Syrian Antioch for a long time. In our breakout groups, the first couple of questions are just to position ourselves as to where Paul is standing as he makes his arguments. Remember that he is coming from a Hebrew Bible perspective. He's, he's trying to relate everything to the prophecies and uh, the law and the things that he knows from the Hebrew Bible. So um, the, the first couple of questions should not take a lot of time. It's the last couple of questions that are the real discussion questions. Under the law of Moses, I, I didn't put this in there, but I, I want you to know that under the law of Moses, there were all sorts of sacrifices for unintentional sins, but not so much for intentionally doing each other harm. In your discussion, you might consider whether this distinction between intentional and unintentional sin might help understand Paul's comments. Or you may decide it's completely irrelevant. You really like to challenge us. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Ju Julia was mid-sentence when we when we got booted out of the room. Yes, I was thinking if they're going through, you know, because I was saying sometimes you're closer to God, sometimes you're not as close to God. But if all these sacrifices are required, you might pay the price, go through the motions, do because you know other people see. And to be in society, that was important. And I think Paul is saying, you don't have to do that. It's not for us to see. It's between you and God. Hmm. We talked a lot about um, the difference between intentional and unintentional sins and whether unintentional, like for in the Catholic Church, whether unintentional is, is venal and intentional is mortal. Um, and so that that question of, I, I can't remember if you said it, Gail, or, or where, but it's like, Unintentional sins could be forgiven, but intentional sins could not. Is that right? Um, well, it it wasn't um, all that from the Hebrew Bible point of view, which is where Paul was operating from. Uh, there's a whole lot of elaborate um, sacrifices and things for unintentional sin, both at the individual, priestly, leadership and community levels. 
but mostly if you like murdered somebody, they just took you out and stoned you. There wasn't a sacrifice for that. You see what I mean? You could, if you, you know, touched a dead body and became unclean, there was a ritual for that. If you, you know, there was a, a sacrifice for that. It was for the, the things where you weren't intentionally hurting each other was what the because law it's was. It's not just a matter of unintentional versus intentional. It's maybe a matter of hurting somebody versus violating a law that really didn't do very much. Right. If you, you know, if you stepped out of bounds and you didn't mean to, or you forgot to do something, or, you know, you, you, you accidentally hurt somebody in a, you know, in fact, there was one we covered in a class at one point, I, I remember where, where um, if two men were fighting and they accidentally punched a pregnant lady and she lost the baby, there was, there was a rule about that, you know, there, so, so there was, but, and, and if you, um killed somebody and it was manslaughter if it was if you did not if it wasn't murder not intentional murder premeditated or intentional murder god set up cities of refuge where you could run and be safe until you could have a trial so they wouldn't kill you immediately um mm. that kind of thing hmm. see now i was having trouble um with with the, today's story and with Paul's narrative in the synagogue and the questions about his theology and how that connected to intentional versus unintentional sin. Right, and it may not. I just wanted to throw that out there because clearly the law of Moses d did not offer righteousness to cover intentional sin hmm. oh, but gotcha. maybe that's not what paul was talking about at all well i mean we focused also on the the part of uh, acts where it says um through him everyone who believes is set free from every sin and so that's where the difference between intentional and unintentional came in if you really could not under the law of moses be forgiven for an, an intentional sin it sounds like Paul is saying uh, everyone who believes through Jesus is um, is set free or forgiven of every sin. It does yeah. sound like that, doesn't it? And the, the Greek yeah. there is really awkward. And if you compare uh, translations, different translations, you get a little bit different spin on it. The Greek kind of in its raw state says, and from all in which the law of Moses could not justify you, in Jesus, everyone who believes is justified. Oh. Right. That's that's kind of what I said was, I think that it, it signifies uh, a shift. Like you said, the Hebrew Bible that Paul was operating in, that now he is saying, actually, this isn't the lay of the land, folks this is the lay of the land that if you believe and jesus has come for all your sins whether you intended them or you didn't you know and also we started at the beginning with just i'll recap a little bit um on the first question why would paul begin his talk with the statement that you provided um i think we all kind of agreed that it was a framework um, a ground groundwork for establishing his authority that he knew the Jewish Bible, that he understood the law. And so he was establishing his authority. Hmm. And then when we moved on to the second question, it was who is Jesus to Paul and how is he presenting Jesus? And there was quite a good discussion on that, but I think that the note I made was that Jesus was the one God had promised. Right. And he was careful in the way he worded that with the people. So they didn't get all hung up on the, the Messiah King. Mm -hmm. So there was that. And then we moved down to the third one where we spent quite a bit of time. And the note I made 
from that, although there was so much good decision discussion, was the under the law that's still not adequate, and Jesus is the solution to be free or to justify us. Mm -hmm. And then we took a side turn, like happens in breakout <laughs> sessions. <laughs> And we talked a little bit about why the Jewish leaders were threatened. Mm -hmm. And two things we thought about were they were afraid of losing control of the people and their mindset and the mm -hmm. synagogue's revenues because mm -hmm. money changed hands to purchase those sacrifices. They ate those sacrifices, the Jewish leaders did the priests. oh the priests well wait a minute there because because sacrifices and priests only happen in jerusalem at the temple synagogues oh. are like community centers where okay. people go and gather and read scripture and discuss it and argue over it and have breakout groups <laughs> well that was a big discussion for us was yeah why did they feel so threatened that they had to cause problems for Paul and ultimately get things stirred up where he gets stoned? Right. Martha, you've got an observation. Well, I just, Can you move forward a little? A quick, just a quick question. So if sacrifices were only offered in the temple in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. what did people do who lived far from Jerusalem to take care of their there need to be uh, redeemed through the sacrifice. Right. And that's where the um, living rightly and following the commands of God began to take precedence. So, so oh, there see. was, okay. And they made pilgrimages back to Jerusalem if they could afford to. Yeah. So, so Seems that brings to me, that... me to a thought that I had, which is all of the law that was there um, kept people's minds on God. I'm supposed to behave a certain way, right? I'm supposed to, and I'm doing this because this law from God. Mm -hmm. So was there fear of social breakdown of some sort if people weren't following the law anymore? Was there a fear that people would lose their connection to God if they weren't through all of their daily practices doing things that were, you know, um, God ordained. Or you know, I, ordained. I'm thinking that at least to follow on Julia's point in the minds of these leaders who um, are having a hissy fit, it's, it's that if people stop doing these things things that are you know eating right and doing the things they will lose their identity as jews they suddenly began to be more concerned about whether they were jews and jewish and covered under you know the protections of being jewish and and if people it wasn't as much about god and that's a terrible blanket statement to say and and i and that there are jews you know you can't, you can slice any religion, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, whatever, right down the middle. There's going to be people who are following God and people who are following the religion, right? To follow up on what Martha said, you know, I think it might have to do with people's feeling of connection to God. Mm -hmm. And if they, if they had done something, you know, committed an intentional sin, they might feel like their connection with God was forever severed. Um, and it sound, it seems to me like what Paul is saying is, no, you're, you know, no matter what you have done, your connection with God is not severed. God still uh, is with you. That doesn't mean that what you did is okay, but that the relationship with God is still there. And that's powerful. And Paul, actually, this is, I think you and Martha are right. This is a seed here that Paul then is going to expand on as he thinks about it some more. Well, and that, and then that, I mean, I know that, that 
one of Paul's points when he was preaching was about how Jesus was descended from David and that that was the promise of the prophets. But also mention that David was a man after God's own heart. And everybody in that room must have known the story of David and how many times he screwed up. Yeah, how badly he screwed up. Talk about I mean, intentional sin. He, he was like on the far end of it. Yeah. And maybe that was another point Paul was making was that David, you know, did some pretty horrible things, but God still saw him as a man after his own heart. Yeah. And if you're, if you're focusing on following the law um, and having sins, if you committed intentional sins that they, you could not be forgiven by them. There was no method within the framework of the, of the religious practice to be forgiven from that without a whole lot of rigmarole or possibly being stoned. Right. Um, you're you're either stoned or set out of the community. Those were the solutions. Yeah, yeah. And but then he holds up David. And David wasn't stoned or set out of the community, was he? No. Mm -hmm. David, you know, the 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 promise of the Savior was promised through the line of David. And and David was called a man after God's own heart. And so it's like, okay, we got two things here that don't balance that, that um, you have to hold both of those things. And that's really getting at what I was trying to tease out in that last question, which is, wait a minute. The way God has always operated with his people has not been law bound. It never has been. That's why I sent you the little note about Abraham and about how Abraham came well before Moses. And yet God said, you know, you're fine. You don't need, you are quote righteous, the same word based, but in Hebrew, you are, are righteous because you trust me, because you believe what I'm telling you. Well, I have a question. Oops, I'm sorry. No, um, go ahead. Okay. At the beginning, when Paul was setting up this whole thing, he was in basically Greece area of Europe. Yeah, he was. He was uh, Macedonia is kind of over to the left, but the whole area yeah. had formerly been Greek, and it became Roman and there's all these cultural roots. And so there's people are called Hellenized, which is a, a they they have been Greeked. <laughs> uh -huh. So what I was wondering if part of the reason why Paul was going through all this history is Gentiles probably didn't know it. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. right. They were They'll raised like Jewish it. people yeah. that learned it, you know, from birth. Mm -hmm. Gentiles didn't. So I think he was trying to give some understanding as to why Jesus was important. That well could be. Um, let's Through go. History. I, I heard Woody. Oh, are were you finished, Renee? Yeah. Okay. No, I am finished. Let's do Woody next, and then Martha. Well, now I have to remember what I was going to say. I'm sorry. Um, the uh, <laughs> oh, oh, I know what I was going to say. Well, okay. Your fourth question is why would Paul think it wasn't available under the law of Moses? Is that what is that what Paul thought? I mean, I'm, I'm confused here as to, is that a fact? Was it not available under the law of Moses? Did Paul believe it was not available under the law of Moses? I don't- You mean forgiveness of sins other than these, you know, forgiveness of intentional sin is what you're talking about. Right, right, right. Right. And, and, and it goes back to the definition of forgiveness. And the definition of forgiveness is just, um, I, I'm willing to, to have this relationship continue. Yeah. Or I want to have this relationship continue. And that is, if somebody hurts you and you forgive them, you're not telling them what you did was okay. You're just telling them, I want this relationship to continue. So is that, is that justification? Well, 
is it? I, you know, the, I, the, uh, the, the Greek itself, I put it uh, at kind of at the bottom was that that word can mean you are acquitted as in there is no sin, hasn't been any sin, not a sin, whatever it was, or it, you could simply be being defended as to your innocence. Um, it, it's, uh, it is a righteousness as a state of being. So Martha, let's, let's go with, with what your comment was. Oh, you're talking about Martha? Uh-huh. Did I? Oh. Did I say I'm wrong? Just... We can't hear you, Martha. You're on mm -hmm. mute. I just wanted to briefly um, comment on, or just kind of lift up what Gail said about God told Abraham, you are righteous because you believe in me. You are righteous because you believe in me. That was one of the first direct things God said to any, one of the earliest things we know that God said to anybody, right? Right. And then all of this other stuff happens and we have all this complicated relationship with God and with the law and with our neighbors and with the Romans and with the, you know, the conquerors and the enslavers and all that kind of stuff. And maybe what Jesus is saying is, don't forget what I said to Abraham. Yeah. Maybe that's the lesson. I just think we have so overcomplicated things. What does so righteous much... mean? What, what does righteous mean anyway? Means just, literally. It means just that you are just, that you are um acquitted, that, that you are right with God. Now in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, what I just said is the Greek understanding of what righteous would mean. In the Hebrew Bible, righteous meant you upheld your end of the contract. Would righteous mean you are loved by God? Mm, no, it had more to do with, with the how you are being rather than the it's it's kind of like there there's a two it's a two part thing it's like we have a a, a obligation to our part is to trust God and believe that the things God tells us God will do. Oh, she's back! Oh, she's back. <laughs> Yay! Sorry, my internet connection went down. I asked a question to see if somebody else could clarify the, the confusion in my brain. Um, justification and righteousness, are they like a synonym of each other? Yes. They're the same kind of thing? Same word. It's the same word. Okay. I was trying to figure out whether it was the same word or if they meant two different things. It's you know, the word righteous bothers me because there's so much that's not positive done in the name of being righteous yeah and so for me that word is somewhat of a trigger of a negative connotation and that's i so i tend to go to the other definitions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. i think that's what Paul was warning against. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something about what Paul is saying where, you know, I it's hard to read his mind at this point. Um, but but he's saying there's something more in Jesus than what was available before. Shirley, you've got your hand up. Did you get to say what you wanted to say? That's okay. But um what I was was two things. One is um having the advantage of having a judge in our group, I asked Woody, you know, what would you define the law? What is the purpose of the law? And um, to Woody, how did you say it? I'm trying to remember. It was about... Well, <clears throat> what, I said was, spot. I, what I said was, in my opinion, the, the law is to encourage people to act correctly by basically by the threat of punishment if you don't act correctly. That was it. Mm -hmm. And my- That's a great thing is, mm -hmm. Right? And my whole thing is that doesn't justify you. 
the law, the Ten Commandments, all the other laws that the Jews added to it, making all these little picky uni things that you had to do, none of that justifies you. And I'm sure we'll get into it later, but like the book of Hebrews, he believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. She believed and it was counted to her for righteousness. And that's repeated over and over again. And what gives us the righteousness is believing, not obeying the laws, not having the laws, not, it's faith. Mm -hmm. Which is, goes back to what Gail was saying when God spoke to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And isn't the law just societal guidelines of our expected behaviors so that we get along in an organized fashion? That's a great way to put it too. It, the law seems to be a framework, but it's not the reality. And Paul is trying to say there's a reality here that Jesus embodies. Um, and I want to call your attention to the phrase at, in verse 38 there that says, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. So somehow being righteous, justified, whatever is linked for Paul with forgiveness of sins. And that Jesus is the one who is proclaiming it. Is he saying at this point in his theology, he's not saying, you know, you have to believe Jesus in order to have your sins forgiven. Is he? That's not what and it says. Isn't he, also saying that, isn't he also saying that if that your sins not being forgiven is what keeps you from being righteous or justified? Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Because you are not innocent. Being justified is being innocent. Being righteous is being innocent. And so there's, the law gives the framework for acting righteous, right? And Paul's saying there's more to it than this. Yeah, that word innocent gets me. Because, um, I, I mean, again, normally when you hear the word innocent, you think that means the person didn't do it as sin, whatever it was. But it sounds like it can mean something different to Paul. Right, within the framework of the law of Moses. So we're so always trying... Go ahead, Marlene. I was going to say, so, so basically then what I'm hearing is that what Paul is saying is that if we believe to God, we are innocent. It's like innocent God, in the sense God, of wipes, God just wipes mm -hmm. that. That's right. It's away. kind of like, this is all that matters to God, that yeah. we believe him, that we love him, that we follow him, that we trust him, and that we don't hurt each other. Thank and God, so Oh, sorry, Woody, go ahead. I, well, I was just going to say, it's, it's like uh, God saying, I'm not here to punish you. I will leave that to to uh, your society. Uh, I'm just here to love you and have a relationship with you. And and I think God is here to grow us, to make us, to help us become what God created us to be. It's kind of like we're, we can, it's just, there's life. God is God is life, just like God is love. God is life. Um, and and the other way is is death. You know, the, the paths that we put out for ourselves are death. And so we are nearly to the end of our time for class. And I usually say just a couple of things, but I have more to say this time at the end of class uh, because I, I was just kind of waiting to see if anybody would ask what Jesus had to say about this. And, um, and I want, because I, as we study Paul, 
I want us to always take what Paul says and go back and check what Jesus said and see if that sheds any light on it. Because Paul is coming from the Hebrew Bible, not from what Jesus taught. Is it? it, it one little quick little question. Yeah. No, absolutely. Paul was also raised a Gentile, correct? No, he was raised a Pharisee, but he was a Hellenized Jew, meaning he lived in the Greek part of the world. He did he he went to school in Jerusalem, but he was born in um Cilicia in the Okay. I could not remember what his educational background was. Yeah. So he's he's and he was a, a Roman citizen. He was a Roman citizen, but he was also a Ray educated and raised as a Pharisee and was the son of a Pharisee. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I, I jotted some notes down this morning because, you know, I pray about this class all the time and, and I just felt like it was incomplete. And um, so here's, here's what I wanted to tell you that only a couple of times is it recorded that Jesus says to anyone your sins are forgiven. He says it once to the in like, and it's recorded in all three gospels. One of the places is Matthew nine. Remember the man who's, who was paralyzed and, and the crowd around Jesus was so bad in the house and they went up and dug a hole in the roof and let him down mm -hmm. the roof. So Jesus would heal him. And Jesus looked at that man. He, he said, Jesus saw the friend's faith and looked at the man and said, your sins are forgiven. Um, and the other time Jesus said it was, was if, if you remember when the woman came, Jesus was at dinner with an important person and a woman came in at the back and started weeping over his feet. It was just before he was going to be killed and started just, she was just weeping over him and, and, and her tears fell on his feet and she dried and he, she dried those, his feet with her hair. And the, the people at that dinner party were offended at this woman, sinful woman who came in. And so Jesus addressed the people at the party <laughs> about how that was uh, their attitude was a problem and said that her sins were already forgiven her sins were forgiven they were already forgiven and i think she must have got a shocked face when he said that because he turns to her and he says your sins are forgiven that's Jesus did not go around saying, believe in me so your sins will be forgiven. That is not what Jesus said at all, not even close. What Jesus said was, don't judge so you won't be judged. Don't condemn other people so you won't be condemned. Forgive each other so you will be forgiven. That's in Luke 6, 37. He in the Sermon on the Mount, which is in Matthew 6, he said, if you forgive others, your heavenly father will forgive you. And then at the other end of his ministry, at the Last Supper in Matthew 26, when he held up what we now call communion, he held up the, the wine. He said, this is my blood, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And if you take that in the context of how Jesus taught about forgiveness of sins, he's saying, I forgive. And he did forgive while he was being killed. Right? This is the mechanism for forgiveness of sins. Us forgiving the ones who hurt us. That is the mechanism for forgiveness of sins. And in fact, Jesus very explicitly left all of this in our hands. He told his disciples in John 20, 23, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if not, they're not. Well, he wasn't setting them up to be power hungry moguls, you know, who just decide who's sinned and who's not. What Jesus is doing is set, he's reminding them to be forgiving and merciful. 
He's telling them, remember to forgive people's sins, because if you don't, they're not forgiven. And that's going to be a problem for you. It's a problem for you, not for the people you didn't, you failed to forgive. It's, it's another way of saying, don't judge, so you won't be judged. So the idea that forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus, I'm wondering if we've taken this verse where Paul says, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed. I think when we take that and say, you have to believe in Jesus to have your sins forgiven. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, Jesus is proclaiming our forgiveness of sins, not the, you know, barrier to it. So, so that would, if we kind of back off and take off some of the layers we've put onto what Paul's saying, what Paul has said, it what he's saying here would square with everything that Jesus to told us about how much God loves us and wants to heal us. It would square with the things that Jesus told his disciples about going forth to spread this good news because it is all of a sudden good news again. And perhaps Paul is still thinking about those prophecies from the Hebrew Bible. And he's trying to remind people of the end time promises of peace and goodwill to, to all men that attend the reign of the Messiah. So I think we should be very careful about how we extrapolate verses like the one here in Acts that we've been looking at and make sure that when we quote Paul or impute theology to him, that we make sure we keep it in the context of who God is and what Jesus said about him. Does that I mean, this, this, this just really sort of, in my mind, tears down so much of what modern Christianity teaches is required to quote unquote be a Christian. For me, it also puts Paul in a new light. Yeah, and it takes and it takes the the emphasis that that you know later Christians have put on the crucifixion but that you didn't see the disciples putting out. The disciples focused on the resurrection. Um, but today, more, there's this whole idea about the blood of Christ, that we need the blood of Christ in order to be um, um, saved. And saved means not go to hell. Um, it's so much has evolved in a way that has become unhealthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in a lot of the modern Christian faith because they're not looking at this point that you're making. That Jesus said your sins are forgiven or your sins were already forgiven. And Paul is saying, Jesus, you know, Jesus says, you know. Is proclaiming that. It's just letting you know your sins were forgiven, you know. Yeah. And that was, and that was throughout Jesus's life, not when he, you know, not after he was resurrected, he was saying that when he was alive. That, that these words, which I'm, all I've done is quote, literally Jesus. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. um, we've, we've taken them and um, fit them together in ways that aren't like, as you said, healthy, but I do think that Paul has a whole lot more to say about this in the future. But I want to take Paul in these tiny baby steps where we look at what he really said and when he said it and what was the context for him saying it and that we move forward that way because I believe Paul knew Jesus. I believe Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
I believe Paul loved God. So I don't think he can have gone too far wrong. I think it's our interpretation that has gone far wrong. Julia. I don't know how to raise my hand with the cute. I don't, that's okay. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> so something you said, Gail, and I think this is pertinent to it. It's kind of personal. But when you were talking about what Jesus said, that you need to forgive each other for your sake so that you can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. I recently had an encounter <clears throat> with someone and this is this is huge for me in my life. I've held them in a place of not forgiving them for eons so long you can't even imagine. I'm a nice person. I get I along with everybody. That. But when I encountered them recently, the animosity, the negative issues, all that was gone. And I realized I have finally forgiven them. And the burden that was lifted from me was so so noticeable. I've told friends, I've told my husband, I've told lots of people that this has happened because it's so remarkable that I am now in a better place and I feel that that is only positive going forward. And I don't have a lot of interaction with them, but when I do, it was always tinged with that negativity, with that frustration and all those negative words. And now there is none of that. And my husband always uses the word passion because you don't disdain, you don't hate, you don't fr get frustrated with with those that you don't have strong emotions about and to not have those strong emotions and have that burden lifted from my soul is in fact heaven because it has helped me so much and if there is no afterlife I, this one just got better <laughs> you know? And well that's said. all I know about is this one. I have fire insurance. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I got myself saved. It doesn't get lost. I'm all in. Hmm. But right now is what I know. Yeah. And that is beautiful to me. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is. Thank you for sharing that, Julia. That's wonderful. And that sounds like a good place to stop for the day. <laughs> it's been a whale of a class. Um, Y'all have been wonderful. And we will see you next week. See you next week, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.